Hello, everybody. Thank you all for joining this third webinar of NEMO uh, this year. I'm Anne. I'm the communications officer at NEMO. I hope the sound is OK. If you have any trouble hearing me, please let me know. Um, NEMO, as probably most of you know, is the network of European museum organizations. And it offers museums organizations mainly a platform for exchange, cooperation, and inspiration. And that uh, happens through a number of capacity building activities, as well as a continuous collection of resources, which you can mainly find on our website. Um, NEMO has a concept of advocating, sharing, collaborating, and training. And uh, of course, we do not only support national museum organizations, but the museums themselves and museum professionals, which is probably why you are here uh, today. And we think museums play a very important role for society, especially as places for dialogue and encounter. And that became particularly um, evident when the number of refugees that arrived in Europe uh, particularly increased. And as one of the first responses, Nemo decided to um, collect a list of museum projects that dealt with refugees and migrants, but also guidelines that were developed prior um, by museum organizations to give museums a chance to find a source of inspiration, but also um, see ideas that might help them in their work. And we, of course, want to take this further. And so I'm very excited that today we can host this webinar and we're able to have Simona Bodo, um, who's an independent researcher and consultant, mainly concerned with um, the social agency of uh, museums, to provide an overview of the museum's response to the uh, growing diversity of their audiences, but also to um, introduce some experimental strands of practice that are now um, being yeah, talked about by museums and um, that might be questioning the idea of intercultural work as we know it. And additionally, Simona will also introduce us to a benchmarking tool, which she was involved in developing um, that helps cultural institutions to um, benchmark diversity management. So now I would like to leave the floor to Simona and hope that you enjoy this webinar. Thank you. OK, hi, everybody. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be connected with so many people from all over Europe and from what I could see also from the States, Guatemala, I mean Canada. Um, I only regret I'm not able to see you. The other thing I most regret is that you can see me because webcams has this distinguishing feature of making everybody look horrible <laughs> in any case. Let's start uh, with our webinar. One thing I should say by way of introduction is that if you have any questions or comments on what uh, I will be saying, um, you, you can write uh, in the chat. And then at the end of the session, I will try and answer. Well, I don't know <laughs> if, I, if I'll be able to, to answer all your questions, but I'll try as best as I can to, to pick up on uh, some of them. Anyway, so first of all, I should clarify why I use uh, the expression, the title of my session, I talk about exploring new paradigms. Uh, and in so doing, I will try and raise a few key issues, which I think are becoming central for any museum aspiring to become an intercultural space. The first of such issues is a certain ambiguity around the very notion of uh, what intercultural work uh, in a museum is. Um, the remarks I will make on this subject uh, may be familiar to some of you, I'm sure, uh, 
because they are the result of uh, my research in the past 12 years or so. Uh, but the reason I pick up on them is that uh, I believe they are as relevant today as they were uh, when I was first involved in the study back in 2007, um, commissioned by the DG uh, Education and Culture uh, of the European Commission on National Approaches to Intercultural Dialogue in Europe. That was in preparation of the 2008 European Year uh, of Intercultural Dialogue. And then, mm, you know, these issues kept coming up in other um, subsequent uh, uh, European projects in which I was involved, including map for id uh, that is uh, Museums as Places for Intercultural Dialogue, and then um, uh, the Learning Museum, Brokering Migrants Cultural uh, Participation. You will see all of these projects uh, listed at the end of, of my slides. So it, as a team expert involved in all of these projects, uh, my mm, key research focus has always been on investigating the different understandings of intercultural dialogue and the resulting policy approaches to its promotion in museums across Europe from a very specific and deliberate perspective. That is how cross-cultural interaction is or is not encouraged. That, that is interaction between different groups and not only you know, projects you know, targeted only to migrants. Uh, and the key argument resulting from all of these surveys uh, was that, uh, um, and still is, that in the museum sector, uh, intercultural dialogue is um, mostly still seen more as a goal to be attained than as a process which is ingrained in a museum's practice and in how it actually encourages uh, uh, multiple visions and interpretations. So here is very briefly an overview of the prevailing policy approaches developed by uh, museums in response to the growing diversity of European societies. Uh, I am fully aware that these uh, reflect, mostly reflect a Western European uh, perspective, but I hope that nonetheless they, uh, you know, my reflections will be uh, useful for all of you. Um, the first approach uh, can be described as a showcase indifference approach, that is, uh, all those programs, initiatives which are aimed at promoting uh, native audiences a better understanding and greater respect of other cultures. Uh, so, for instance, Blockbuster's exhibition on, uh, you know, African art and so on. I mean, this is, of course, the most uh, widespread uh, example, but of course I'm talking also about education programs and the like. At the opposite end of the spectrum, we have uh, what we could call a heritage literacy approach, which is basically aimed at uh, uh, helping uh, new citizens become more familiar with the, uh, you know, their receiving country's history, language, values and traditions. And finally, uh, this is an approach which, which is quite common in ethnographic museums, but not only, uh, promoting uh, cultural self-awareness in migrant communities through what is called in jargon, uh, museum jargon, culturally specific programming. So as you can see, very different responses, which reflect not only that uh, ambiguity around the, the very notion of intercultural work I was referring to uh, at the beginning of the session, uh, but also the historical fact that most museums, far from being created, established for the sake of cultural diversity or in order to enhance intercultural confidence, uh, were created to represent and validate national, local and group identities and today are clearly at odds with the new social and political agenda. These approaches, uh, as different as they may seem, also have some key features in common. First of all, they tend to be uh, informed by a very traditional uh, static notion of heritage, which is primarily seen as a closed system, a received patrimony to safeguard and transmit. Uh, the second feature uh, that these approaches uh, have in common is that 
they tend to build projects which are targeted either to migrants or to a native audience, uh, thereby generally avoiding cross-cultural interaction. And thirdly, even where interaction of some, some sort is, is, uh, is, uh, is encouraged between different groups, the main aim is to promote mutual knowledge and respect, which of course in itself is already uh, a very important uh, uh, goal. But they don't uh, really initiate new knowledge systems, relationships, and interpretive communities. So, of course, I'm not suggesting that these three approaches I very briefly outlined are to be discredited or, or, or abandoned, as they all have a very important role to play, um, not least in supporting a multicultural base and in uh, um, helping uh, individuals with a migrant background to retain a vital link with their um, tradition. What I rather wish to argue is that these approaches, these more traditional approaches, find a, a new and fuller uh, legitimacy insofar as they are seen as part of the process, a gradual journey, as you see in the slide, uh, which is ultimately aimed at creating third spaces of shared spaces, if you prefer, um, that is, spaces where individuals are finally allowed to cross the boundaries of belonging and are offered uh, genuine opportunities for self-presentation and collaborative making. So new challenges for museums, in other words, uh, are to go beyond policies targeting uh, individuals and groups according to their ethnicity, uh, working on identity as the start rather than the end of the conversation. Um, that is, in other words, um, addressing needs, not backgrounds. Another challenge is to facilitate new connections between people and objects, generating new inclusive and shared uh, meanings around collections. And this implies, of course, to go beyond uh, that static notion of heritage we just uh, briefly looked at in the previous slide, and to, for example, experiment with new interpretation strategies. Uh, we will come back to this uh, later on. More in general, the challenge is to, to reshape heritage, not so much as a mark of distinction as, as a shared space of social interaction. The ability of museums to uh, rise to this challenge uh, requires a very honest and thoughtful uh, reflection, investigation of what it really means to carry out intercultural work in a museum. Is it about enhancing heritage literacy? This is very often connected with feeling cultural deficits, so to speak, in the eyes of many museum professionals. Is it about compensating Past misrepresentations in museums in the eyes of native audiences, promoting cultural self awareness, or is it rather a bidirectional process which is dialogical and transformative on both sides and we, in, in which all are equal participants? So, big questions, but now turning from a theoretical uh, to a more practical level, it, has, it, it is interesting to see how. These, uh, you know, the issues I've been uh, bringing up so far are reflected in a, a benchmarking tool um, for diversity management in cultural institutions. So not uh, limited to museums, but including also theaters, libraries, archives, and so on, which was developed in the framework of a European project called uh, Broken in Migrants Cultural Participation uh, and uh, which was funded by the DG Home Affairs of the European Commission. This uh, benchmarking tool tracks the potential journey of an institution, in our case a museum, uh, from a basic level uh, um, where the, participa the cultural participation of immigrants is an imposed agenda, that is, the cultural institution reacts to outside pressure, uh, to an advanced level where um, the museum fully reflects uh, the diversity of the surrounding society and promotes fully fledged uh, cross cultural interaction. So, now you see in the slide, I mean, the, 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 the tool was developed with different goals. We'll uh, 
focus today only on the first one. Uh, so let's uh, ha let's have a look at this um, uh, tool, uh, uh, this benchmarking tool, as a sort of grid intended to help uh, museum professionals um, to carry out self-evaluation of where they are in terms of diversity management. Of course, bearing in mind that their progress will be uneven in in, in different areas. We'll have a look now at um, a closer look. At, at least a, a couple of headings of this grid. Okay, you see that uh, the headings are institutional vision and policy, visitors' audiences, Programming, repertoire collections, narrative. Let's bear in mind that this tool was developed for a, a, a wide range of uh, cultural institutions, not only museums, and partners, collaborators, staff, boards, governing bodies, and suppliers. Um, let's go very quickly to. Um, have a look at the first two headings, that is institutional vision and policy and, and uh, how visitors are perceived. Just to have an idea of how, you know, this journey uh, can be, can, you know, uh, evolve towards uh, a full-fledged uh, cross-cultural interaction, as I said. For instance, at the basic level, the promotion of MCP, of course, is the, the acronym for Migrants Cultural Participation, is seen as a socio-political rather than a cultural goal. Uh, the cultural institution faces demands from policymakers or society. So how mm, this uh, migrant cultural participation is envisioned by the cultural institutions, like making public statements um, in, speech, in speeches or promotional documents, so starting to state how important it is to reach out to people with a migrant background, some first efforts are made to become more familiar with the surrounding uh, communities. Uh, barriers to access and participation are identified. Uh, and in the heading, visitor audiences, you can see that uh, uh, the cultural institution perceive uh, immigrants as culturally distinct groups whose differences are to be accommodated in some way or the other. Um, the cultural institution uses random opportunities or individual contacts to identify and involve migrants as potential audiences. And uh, most significantly, the cultural institution identifies uh, immigrants as the exclusive target group for any uh, migrant cultural participation project. Let's see what happens at the next stage, which we decided to call lower intermediate. Um, here, the, the, I would say the museum, uh, to, to, instead of cultural institution, endorses a more dynamic understanding of culture, uh, is committed to the notion of diversity as richness, and starts to uh, uh, implement uh, this, uh, this uh, new uh, uh, policy by uh, drafting key documents stating the importance of uh, promoting the access of uh, migrant audiences, creates consultation groups and opportunities uh, for exchange uh, between uh, museum staff and also other uh, local actors. And um, um, what came out uh, from the learning, uh, sorry, from the consultation processes is used to start to break down identified barriers to access and participation. Can you see it more clearly, maybe? Okay. Uh, at this stage, uh, commitment to promoting uh, uh, the cultural participation of immigrants has been entrusted to a particular department of the museum, whether it be education, outreach, or access development. Um, 
At this level, the second generation of immigrants has come, in, has come into view. So basic level, basic, basically, it's, it's a matter of uh, addressing uh, people who have uh, recently arrived uh, and who have very different needs. So uh, second generation migrants come into view of the museum. And uh, um, the museum starts to carry out uh, uh, surveys, ad hoc surveys, identifies uh, uh, migrant groups and individuals as the main target group for its project. However, it also starts to seek opportunities to encourage interaction with native audiences. Um, and let's go on. Because it's a lot, I mean, you'll have plenty of time to have a look in detail at the. I cannot go for that. Sorry about this. Okay. Okay, thank you. So the upper and intermediate level, um, the museum sees itself as, as a cultural space for interaction, participation, and cooperation. Uh, diversity policies are seen as a tool for internal change, so you can see how things are evolving. Uh, the results of consultation processes are fully integrated in the museum's uh, uh, migrants' cultural participation policy. And the museum has created dedicated structures, uh, for instance, working groups, uh, specialist department, um, um, interdepartmental uh, collaboration, and so on. <coughs> um, the museum considered the needs uh, preferences and aspiration of people with a migrant background on an equal footing with those of native uh, visitors. Has developed a thorough knowledge and understanding of the local situation in terms of intercultural dynamics and immigration, collects information about uh, migrants' cultural participation upon which consistent policies can be built regularly. And finally, the advanced level, there is a commit, uh, commitment to fully reflecting intercultural innovation at all institutional levels. Uh, the museum's policy documents uh, or contracts with third parties contain statements to this effect. There is a commitment to building intercultural uh, competence into the institutional fabric and into <coughs> decision-making processes. So once again, you see what kind of changes can, can take place. Okay. Okay. So, I mean, just this was just to give you an idea. Then uh, you can download, as you can see from uh, the link in the slide, um, you can download this benchmarking tool uh, from. Uh, uh, <coughs> the MCP Brokers uh, website and have a closer look at it. Uh, one important remark to make about this tool is that, um, you know, the, 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 the different levels described uh, in it uh, need not be seen in conflict with each, with each other. Um, in other words, the um, uh, benchmarking tool is not me meant to suggest that once uh, a museum has reached the advanced level, then all the issues addressed at the other levels become relevant. Well, of course, ideally, uh, a museum which has uh, reached uh, the, 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 you know, the advanced level in terms of uh, institutional vision of, uh, and policy, well, this should be uh, ideally an irreversible uh, process. But on the other hand, programming repertoire, for instance, uh, can and should be adjusted to meet specific needs. Uh, for instance, let's think uh, about all those uh, programs run in uh, 
museums in the UK for uh, which are called ESO programs, English for other uh, for speakers of other languages. So I mean, it may it might be the case that a museum which has advanced to the uh, highest level, so to speak, in, in terms of diversity management, will still keep on addressing these these needs. I mean, we don't have to forget that migration is a multifaceted phenomenon. Um, ranging from first arrivals to refugees um, uh, flows to second, third generation immigrants who uh, demand to take part in cultural life on their own terms and uh, refuse to be, to be pigeonholed as minority groups. So this means that we really cannot envisage uh, a one size fits all recipe uh, to address this issue. So to explore on a yet more practical level uh, how museums can make their way through these different levels described in the benchmarking tool and how more in general they can uh, address those challenges uh, which we saw earlier on, uh, I would now focus on a particular uh, strand of, uh, of experimentation which is currently flourishing in, uh, in some particularly uh, forward-looking museums in Italy. Uh, that is the training and the active involvement of museum mediators with migrant background, um, um, which is aimed at exploring a more dialogical and multivocal interpretation of collections, whether it be uh, through the planning of narrative trails, collaborative exhibitions, and so on. And I will do it by uh, having a closer look at a case study which is particularly interesting because uh, it shows that kind of institutional uh, progression and change which is outlined uh, uh, more in a more abstract way in the benchmarking tool. Uh, the case study is the Museum Mediators project uh, uh, run by the Gallery of Modern and Contemporary Art in Bergamo. Uh, from now on, I will call it GAMEC more quick. Um, in the early 2000s, GAMEC uh, started to address the issue of migrant cultural participation, starting from the acknowledgement uh, that uh, new citizens in Bergamo uh, were actually uh, not represented at all in the museum's audience. Um, <clears throat> This led to a, a first project, uh, the Guests of Honor project, which was meant to uh, understand uh, on the ground, practically, uh, how GAMEC was perceived by these new citizens, what kind of expectations, concerns, and requests they had. And the interesting thing is that as a result of this pro uh, project, uh, one need which came up was to have a group of mediators with a migrant background which uh, could act as a bridge between the museum and these uh, non-audiences. So a first uh, training course for museum mediators was launched in 2007, which led to the creation of a permanent group of over 30 mediators, which uh, still work uh, for, for GAMEC today, keep on working for GAMEC today. Um, it is interesting to, to, to to underline that this initiative, this first training course, was from the start uh, um, qualified uh, uh, as a cultural rather than a social uh, initiative. And I think it is very important to uh, stress this aspect of the Museum uh, uh, Mediators Project as a whole, um, because since the beginning, it was not only a matter of promoting audience development or uh, promoting uh, the democratization of culture, which uh, of course uh, still is the case, as you can see in the second bullet point, you know, the second objective, the second goal of, of the training course, to encourage increased levels of awareness and use of the collections. But uh, what is most significant is that from the very start, uh, uh, this training course showed a clear commitment on the part of the museum to exploring new interpretation strategies with, which would create new connections between people and objects. Of course, mediators were and still are today uh, rigorously trained from an art historical point of view. 
but they also are encouraged to explore, to freely explore ways in which uh, other dimensions of interpretation can be tapped in uh, alongside uh, more traditional heritage literacy goals or concerns about scientific expertise. Over time, uh, the, 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 after, this, sorry, after this first training course for museum mediators, um, there were continued opportunities uh, for further training, for, for professional growth, um, often shared with GAMEX uh, uh, educators, and aimed at developing specific planning, interpretive and relational skills. We will look at one of them, um, interpretive skills, I mean, uh, which is storytelling. And uh, over time, um, the role of mediators uh, gradually shifting from acting as bridges between their respective communities and the museum, uh, mainly through visits uh, in their mother tongue, to engaging diverse audiences in intercultural activities. So the active involvement of mediators in the planning of programs and activities uh, is today a constant feature of the museum's cultural policy, ranging from initiatives which are aimed at uh, drawing uh, new audiences in or welcome, uh, welcoming refugees, for instance, uh, to the design of more, far more complex projects um, in which new interpretive uh, communities are created as the goals of the 12 storytellers, <coughs> storytellers in search of an author project uh, clearly show. Storytelling actually was not a novelty for, for, uh, for uh, GAMEC. Um, uh, in 2010, there was a training course uh, which was uh, um, uh, specifically aimed at um, you know, creating new storytelling ski, uh, skills in uh, mediators. But uh, at that time, the training course did not actually lead to the development of narrative, uh, narrative trails. This time around, I mean, the 12 storytellers in search of an author's uh, case, um, storytelling uh, turned out to be a crucial tool first to overcome the museum's self-referential self um, language, which is very often elitist and uh, exclusively based on scientific expertise. But it also uh, turned out to be a powerful tool to convey emotion and lived experiences alongside art historical context and to help all individuals to approach heritage in a way that gets them personally involved. The second goal you see <coughs> um, of, of, the, of this project is uh, connected with a partnership which GAMEX started uh, with NABA is the acronym for uh, New Academy of Fine Arts in Milan. So there was also, uh, cross fertilization between narrative and creative per perspectives on museum collections, because uh, not only museum mediators develop their narrative trails, but also NABA students produce their own videos on the artworks mm -hmm. which were chosen by uh, <clears throat> uh, museum mediators. So let's have a look at. Uh, uh, um, uh, some uh, excerpts from, uh, from a couple of videos um, in the mother tongue of uh, museum mediators. Just to give you a, an idea, then you, you'll have all links provided, you can have a look uh, at them at length. Um, just to have an idea of how evocative and different distance they look and sound from uh, more traditional uh, guided tools. Uh, I'm sorry, that there is no uh, mother tongue. No mother tongue is English, so I'm going to show you. Um,
בן אדם עומד מול עץ. איזה מקום יותר טוב מלעמוד מול עץ יכול להיות כדי לדבר? אין צוקוק נולד בכפר קטן ליד המקום, כבר חקלאי. כפי שהוא מדבר על מוות. אני אספר לכם על הפעם שראיתי את החיים באדמה שנתנה לי את החיים. פעם הוא עשה ציור של שבעה מטרים עצום, ואז הוא קבר אותו, ולא ראינו אותו, הוא פשוט נעלם לחלוטין. ועל זה אני אספר לכם. L'acqua e la vita. La donna e la vita. Questa vita l'ha portata qua con me. E la mia vita l'ho ricevuta dalla mia mamma e lei dalla mia nonna. La mia nonna che era la portatrice d'acqua e l'ha consegnato questo a me. Orgogliosa, forte, impiegabile, come le portatrici d'acqua di dipinto di Massimo Calpirio. Io non sono così. Io non ho la forza della mia nonna, ma ho tutte le forze per diventare e per difendere la mia vita e quella della mia figlia. Non ho mai visto mia nonna piangere. Io piango. Dio quanto pianto. Ho pianto mentre che camminavo nella, nelle strade affollate dentro la mia solitudine. Mi sembrava di avere un sorgente d'acqua nello stomaco. Ho pianto mentre che guardavo le foto della mia nonna con desiderio di tornare quando ero bambina per sedere sulle sue ginocchia mentre che mi, mi accarezza con le sue mani ruvide del lavoro duro. Sorry about this. I meant to show the Russian uh, version. Uh, I mean, of course, uh, Italian participants in the webinar benefit, benefit, benefited from this. But in any case, on, on, um, you, will, you, will, you will see all the, the links at the end of the slides. Um, uh, you will find all the videos, both in Italian and the uh, mediator's uh, mother language. Uh, as, you will, uh, as you will have noticed, especially in the first video, uh, um, there are parts where mediators are performing their stories um, with a magnified image of the artwork projected on the wall uh, behind them. And this was part of the creative reinterpretation of the narrative phrase on the part of the NAPA students. Um, so here you can find uh, some links uh, regarding the different projects uh, which make part of the overall program with museum mediators and uh, these links are to the english version uh, of the project descriptions for italian participants you just go on the website patrimonio intercultura and in the section esperienze you will get all of uh, these projects uh, described in italian
Very briefly to conclude, uh, I just wanted to uh, strongly recommend you to have a look at another uh, project, um, which uh, you know I'm sure will help you in exploring this experimental strand of actively involving uh, museum mediators as new interpreters of cultural heritage, which is the project uh, um, by a big state museum, uh, Brera Picture Gallery, um, a project which is less interesting that, uh, than GAMEC's program uh, uh, with museum mediators because it didn't have the same institutional impact. It was limited in time. Did not leave a permanent trace in the institutional fabric. Um, but it is, on the other hand, it is very interesting in terms of uh, the, the effectiveness and the balance with which uh, narrative trails were built in combining um, uh, art historical content, content and um, the autobi autobiographical uh, dimension. So, uh, once again, I recommend you to have a look at this. And uh, as you can see, there is a documentary which is uh, very interesting in Italian, not subtitled, but uh, I have translated the, the, you know, what mediators say in the documentary into English. So, uh, if you want to have the English translation upon request, uh, I can send it to you through the uh, name of office. The last slides I just want to add very quickly, you know, of course, uh, museums and immigration is, is a huge subject. I, I chose a very particular perspective uh, to address the, the issue um, instead of, uh, you know, just staying at the surface of such a huge, uh, you know, uh, subject, um, but to, you know, uh, make up for this uh, very specific uh, perspective, I, I added at the end uh, of my slide some uh, links to uh, resources uh, which you can easily find on the web, starting from websites and blogs. Uh, here you see the project, the, the project websites uh, in which I was uh, involved. Reports, guidelines, repertoires of good practice, publications and papers. <coughs> and recent documents by the EU and Council of Europe. Uh, also an interesting upcoming co conference in, in Stockholm in a few days. So uh, the slides, I will make my slides available to Nemo, Nemo Office. Um, I don't know whether they're going to upload it on, on the website or send them to you individually, but uh, definitely uh, they're, they're there for you. And, um, and now I think we should start maybe answering some questions. Ah, this one. Could we use museum as a place to involve and manage multiculturalism in classrooms and in an educational context? Well, of course, yes. I think that uh, in many countries, uh, schools are the natural context uh, in which to start this kind of work because the classrooms are, uh, you know, the ideal places to, to have the, that cross-cultural interaction I was talking about. Um, you know, in, on the website Patrimonio Intercultura, which is translated into English as well, although, uh, you know, not all the projects, unfortunately, um, there are many examples of intercultural projects in school. I think that uh, a more challenging task would be to involve also adult audiences in this kind of, of programs. Um, okay, the initiatives that are showcased that are interesting and necessary, but for now I keep wondering whether we are not essentializing the groups involved by focusing on them. And especially in these times of Brexit, Trump, and the like, we are putting in enough effort to involve the disenfranchised locals. Okay, well, what I like about these, uh, uh, maybe it was uh, it was not clear from from uh, from uh, uh, the slides, but in Gamex example, for instance, 
As I said, me mediators were first involved as bridges uh, to reach uh, their respective communities. But over the years, so I mean now uh, uh, 10 years, because it started in 2007, um, uh, mediators have started to address um, diversified groups, so groups where both migrants uh, and Italian people, uh, enfranchised people, are involved. And also the Brera project uh, was uh, aimed uh, at a diverse audience. So immigrants, yes, but mostly Italian uh, frequent visitors. So I think that you can have good examples of that as well. Uh, I know Valentina. Okay, my question is, how can art museums improve access and participation through their collection through art? Expanding collection, explore art by artists from minority groups. Well, uh, definitely. Um, but I mean, the two examples I showed you uh, come from uh, art museums. And I think that apart from expanded collections, which is in the case of art museum, a particularly uh, you know, complex task. I think that uh, using, for instance, uh, storytelling is a, is a very powerful way to um, get people interested and, and emotionally involved in, in collections while learning something about it uh, from an art historical point of view. Um, Chris, sorry, I must be <laughs> quickly answering because I'm trying to answer all the question. Uh, to explain perhaps, uh, how do we break notions of infrastructural structural racism that museums institutions are also responsible, uh, etc., especially within the context of the crisis of European border regime policies practices, since we talk about migration, refugees, and trans migrants? I'm not sure I get uh, the meaning. How do we break notion of infrastructural structural racism? Chris, maybe maybe you can you can expand on this because I don't I don't, I don't understand the question. Are there any other questions? Why well, maybe Chris okay, is writing? Right. Yes. <clears throat> Sorry, but speaking some type of prescription. <laughs> oh no, my goodness, I didn't see all the other. Uh, okay, I meant uh, within museum work. How can you break notions of uh, racism through museum work? Well, I mean, uh, for instance, with mediators uh, from migrant backgrounds, you can get incredible insights into what, uh, what uh, complex experiences these people come from. Racism is is uh, very often um, uh, focusing on uh, labeling uh, individuals across, the, you know, according to their ethnicity, according to their religion and faith, and so on. And these mediators uh, provide such a, a rich insight into the, the, the life experiences they come from and, and how these connect very deeply with life experiences of. Uh, native audiences, so to speak. Sorry, I don't like this uh, this uh, term, but it's the you know the, the the quickest I can use. I mean, you really cre create personal connections which go beyond issues of uh, identities, fixed identities. Um, other question, which I don't know. 
puhua siitä. Dania, there have been many discussions on transcultural heritage. You think adopt, adopting a transcultural perspective to heritage and museum curatorial practices could be more productive. Well, uh, what do you mean by transcultural in addition to, because there is a lot of confusion between multicultural, intercultural, transcultural. I think that in a way, uh, the, the project uh, I very briefly introduced are transcultural. Third spaces, yes, absolutely. I think they're very, very uh, far more productive than the traditional approaches uh, I showed you earlier on in the slides. Okay, we, sorry, I was told we have to, to terminate the webinar. I'm sorry because we could go on hours to, to discuss these, uh, these issues and uh, forgive me, if, of course, uh, English not being my mother language, sometimes it's not that easy for me to make myself clear. In any case, I hope you enjoyed the webinar um, and uh, please get in touch uh, if you need any more uh, feedback and you know discussion with me over the uh, issues we've been uh, touching in the webinar. Thank you very much. <laughs>